Beginning in 1916, artist Norman Rockwell painted a series of scenes on the American way of life. He painted over 300 covers on the Saturday Evening Post magazine, and they've become classics in American art. His paintings always picture a perfect family, like Ozzie and Harriet, and I Love Lucy, and Father Knows Best. But the Rockwell paintings had very little to do with reality. Ozzie, as we later learn, ruled the Nelson family as a tyrant. Ricky and Lucy got divorced, and we learned that Father didn't always know best. Tomorrow, as we all know, is Mother's Day. 59% of Americans said they were blessed by their mothers and they want to honor their mothers on Mother's Day. 41% of Americans said they disliked or strongly resented Mother's Day. For that 41%, Mother's Day brings sad memories, bitterness, even pain. The 41% includes those who long to be mothers but can't, those who live without their mothers because of divorce or separation or death, those who have or who have had an abusive, addicted, or neglectful mother, or those who have lost their child to death and, and, and so on. God cares about the pain and the heartache he permits surrounding every child. As well as the pain and heartache he permits in mothers. We can't choose our mothers or the difficulties we experience as a child. And a mother can't always choose her circumstances. But when we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, he gives us the power for how we respond. It should comfort us as mothers and as adult children if we experience less than satisfactory families to read scripture and to understand that many of our life's situations occurred in scripture too. And we see many things in scripture that show us that families are not Norman Rockwell paintings. For example, Adam and Eve walked and talked with God and they raised a murderer for a son. Now, not many of us have a murderer in our families. Consider not being able to feed your child like Elijah's widow in 1 Kings 17. Or dealing with the soldiers that are assigned to kill your baby, as Jochebed did, and putting him in a little handmade basket, floating him in the edge of a river that was filled with crocodiles, and just praying he would live in Exodus 2. Consider Hannah. Hannah couldn't have a child. When society valued your worth by the number of children you could produce, aren't you glad we're still not valued on that basis? She lived with constant hostility and mockery by Elkanah's other wife, 1 Samuel 1. And you know, it's hard for me not to be downright enraged. It, it, it makes me angry every time I read that Lot was willing to offer his daughters to be molested by a crowd of wicked men banging on his door in Genesis 19. 
or when King David simply got upset, a little angry, when Amnon molested his sister Tamar, 2 Samuel 13. That's probably one of the most dysfunctional families in the Bible. Yet he was a man after God's own heart. Has it ever occurred to you, have you ever wondered about Salome? How she must have felt. Her mother made her go in and dance before her drunken king husband, Herod Antipas, and then asked for John the Baptist to be beheaded. Now think of this. This early teenage girl had to carry John the Baptist's bloody head on a silver platter to her mama. I doubt that any of us had a mother like that. You see, the Bible shows us that since the beginning of Earth's history, there hasn't been a perfect mother or a perfect family. Norman Rockwell's paintings are simply not reality. Since this is true, it's time to forgive and forget those things that Satan keeps bringing up into our minds that aren't good memories of our childhood. You see, since God forgives our sins, we can forgive our moms and our dads when they weren't perfect. You see, regardless of how we see the past, we are not the byproduct of an impersonal biological process. Psalms 139 says, God saw every one of us in the womb before we were born. Not one of us is an accident. Our birth mother had the breathtaking privilege of sharing with God the creation of a new life. So in many ways, the role of God is expressed through motherhood, regardless of whether or not our mothers lived up to God's standards of behavior. But while a mother gives physical birth, the Bible says in Galatians 3, 26 and 27, so in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. 1 John 3, 1 says, see what great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. Christians, shouldn't we have the best self-image in the world all the time? Because children of God are set apart for God, called by God, and they love God and honor God. He's our Father. The most wonderful Father in the universe loves us beyond the greatest of our imaginations. We are his precious children. We were given birth by a woman on earth, but we are God's children. Do you know this makes us royalty? We are the children of the king of the universe. Christian psychologist James Michelson once counseled a woman who constantly felt lonely and abandoned, regardless of the family around her. She revealed to the psychologist that her mother had conceived her before marriage and had always told her, laughingly, as a family joke, that she was an unplanned mistake. Dr. Michelson opened his Bible and shared with this woman Psalms 100, verse 3. It is he who made us, not we ourselves. The doctor explained to her that not one of us is on this earth by accident. 
This knowledge changed this woman's life. The woman was actually ecstatic. She says, I'll never forget this day as long as I live. From then on, she saw herself as God's child with a future waiting for her in heaven. You see, God's plan was for every child to have a mother who would love them just as God loves us unconditionally with every fiber of her being. But we live in a sinful world where mothers die, they walk away from their children and homes, where they just don't know about the love of Jesus Christ. And so they inadvertently rob their children of a knowledge of their royal heredity. How wonderful it is when we find priceless mothers who do love God and who were willingly, who willingly fulfill their role as caretakers of God's precious children. One of the most beautiful real life stories in our nation's history was about a nine-year-old boy who was born in Kentucky. He moved to Southern Indiana where his mother died. His father brought home a new bride who had three little girls. The boy was so upset, almost frantic. He didn't know if he could possibly ever love that woman like he loved his mother. He and his sister Sarah didn't want to accept a stepmother. He was afraid he would forget his birth mother. But the boy's stepmother was a wonderfully kind Christian woman. He came to call this loving, wonderful woman, his angel mother. Later on, Abraham Lincoln would say, as the 16th president of the United States, all that I am or ever hope to be, I owe to my angel mother. Love. It's so necessary to life and so difficult for many people to understand and practice. So difficult for us to believe the depth of God's love for us. Yet it's so easy for Satan to control our anger and our feelings and our resentments about our childhood that people hang on to year after year after year. It is Satan who urges us to cling to the bad things that may have happened to us. Satan wants us to hate. God begs us to love. When an expert on Jewish law asked Jesus in Matthew 22, 36 to 40, Good teacher, what is the greatest commandment in the law? You know what Jesus answered. Jesus said, it's this. You shall love God with all your heart and your soul and your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. Then in John 13, verses 34 to 36, Jesus said, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. So now I'm giving you a new commandment, love each other. Then Jesus told them in verse 35 that this is to be the identification badge of Christians. They're going to identify you by how much you love other people. This is the prescription for motherhood, to share God's unconditional love with their children. He calls mothers to always be kind to their children. 
help their children develop the person he wants them to become, help those children develop their talents. You know, I wish I could do it all over again. I absolutely loved the years of raising Scott and Sherry. It was fun. Stephen Glenn tells a wonderful story about a famous research scientist who had made several very important medical breakthroughs. He asked the scientist, why, in his opinion, are you so much more creative than the other scientists around you? And this scientist said it was because of his mother. He said, for example, when he was a small boy, he had been trying to get a bottle of milk out of the refrigerator when he lost his grip and it created an ocean of milk on the kitchen floor. When his mother came into the kitchen, instead of yelling at him, giving him a lecture, or punishing him, she said, Robert, what a wonderful mess you've made. I've rarely seen such a huge puddle of milk. Well, the damage has been done. Would you like to play in the milk a little while before we clean it up? And Robert thought that was a great idea. After a few minutes of splashing in the milk, his mother said, you know, Robert, when you make a mess like this, eventually we got to clean it up. So how would you like to do that? Would you like to use a sponge or a towel or a mop? He chose his method of cleanup and his mother said, you know, what we have here is a failed experiment in how to effectively carry a big bottle of milk with two little hands. Let's go out in the backyard and we'll fill up the bottle with water and we'll figure out a way to carry it without dropping it. The boy learned that if he put his hand on the top and the bottom of the bottle, he could carry it without dropping it. And he said it was a wonderful lesson. This renowned scientist then remarked that at that moment he learned that mistakes were just opportunities for learning something new, which is after all what scientific experiments are all about. Not every child is fortunate enough to have a loving mother all the time. Most of us fall into the category of this poem by an unknown author. A weary mother returned from the store, lugging groceries through the kitchen door. Awaiting her arrival was her eight-year-old son, eager to tell what his younger brother had done. While I was out playing and dad was on call, I, he took his TJ, TJ took his crayons and wrote on the wall. It's on the red paper you just hung in the den. I told him you'd be mad at having to put it up again. She let out a scream and pulled her hair at her brow. Where is your little brother right now? She emptied her arms with a purposeful stride. She marched to his room where he'd run to hide. She called his full name as she entered his room. He trembled with fear. His full name meant doom. For the next 10 minutes, she ranted and raved about the expensive wallpaper and how she had saved. Lamenting all the work it would make, take to repair, she condemned his actions and total lack of care. The more she scolded, the matter she got, then stomped from his room totally distraught. She headed for the den to confirm her fears. When she saw the wall, her eyes flooded with tears. The message she read pierced her soul like a dart. It said, I love mommy surrounded by a heart. Well, the wallpaper remained 
just as she found it, with an empty picture frame hung around it. A reminder to her as clear as a bell, pray first, then listen before you yell. Somebody should have read that to me when my children were born. We've all experienced mommy moments like this, but through it all, whatever they did, we've loved our kids unconditionally. And most of us would fight to the death for them. I read a story about a mother and it made me laugh out loud because it sounds just like something I would do. It says, her son was playing baseball and she was in the bleachers. Her son fumbled the first catch at first base. Then he fumbled the next catch at first base. A man standing behind the bleachers started screaming, who is that stupid, stupid, stupid kid? If he can't catch a ball, get him out of the game. We're going to lose our game because of that stupid, stupid kid on first base. The mother stood up, made her way to the back of the bleachers, and stood beside the man. He looked at her and said, did you see what that stupid kid did? Without looking at the man, she said, you're lucky you're still alive. <laughs> the man looked at her and said, what? She repeated, you're lucky you're still alive. He said, what do you mean? I'm lucky to still be alive. Staring straight ahead, she said, well, I'm that stupid kid's mother, and I left my gun in the car, or you'd be dead. <laughs> she turned and went back to her bleacher seat and sat down. The man didn't say another word the rest of the ball game, not even when the stupid kid's team lost. I can speak for mothers everywhere. Don't mess with my kids. Amen? See, a mother's love was put in us by God. It's, we are to embrace that protective instinct that God put in us. But we aren't to use vengeance at a baseball game. In fact, Paul writes in Romans 12, 19, never take your own vengeance, blood beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine and I will repay, says the Lord. A mother's unconditional love for her children is a pale reflection of the depth of God's love for every one of us. If we feel protective because somebody picks on our kid, think how God feels when Satan picks on us. We are his heirs. We're the children he died to save. And he wants his children to be just like him. He wants us to love like he loves. Jesus said, as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. The selfish, sacrificial love, selfless, sacrificial love of Jesus is what great motherhood is all about. It's what the cross is all about. Wicked men nailed Jesus Christ to the cross, and God still loves us. Is that not amazing? The bond between Jesus and those who love him can never be broken. When we love like Jesus loves, it lifts us out of our self-pity, it lifts us out of our self-absorption, it brings us into a daily relationship a working relationship with God.
between God and his children, between God and you and me, his beloved children. What a different world we would have if we just understood how much God loves us. If we just understood that he's the king of the universe and we are royals, we are his royal children. When we teach our children to walk with Jesus in every aspect of their lives, they're secure. They know they're loved. They're rich in the bounties of heaven. Consider this story of a wonderful Christian mother who raised her children alone. But more than anything, she raised them to know and love Jesus. The story begins, I'll never forget Easter, 1946. My dad had died five years ago. My four older siblings were married with kids. And now just mom and us three sisters were living in our little house. I was 14. My little sister Osi was 12. My older sister Darlene was 16. Our mom always told us how blessed we were that our father now was the king of the universe and we were his children. We never felt the lack because mom said we were blessed and rich in ways others were very poor. She was always so loving and happy. We believed her. A month before Easter, the pastor of our church announced a special Easter offering would be taken to help a poor family. He asked everyone to give sacrificially. When we got home, mom called a meeting of us three girls to discuss how we could be like Jesus and sacrifice for this family. We decided to buy 50 pounds of potatoes and live on them for a month. This would allow us to save $20 on our grocery bill. And if we kept our electric lights off as much as possible and didn't listen to the radio, we'd save money on the electric bill. Darlene got as many house and yard cleaning jobs as possible. Both of us babysat for everyone we could. For 15 cents, we could buy enough cotton loops to make potholders and we could sell them from door to door for a dollar and we made $20 on potholders. That month was the best year of our lives. Every evening, we counted the money to see how much we had saved. At night, we sat in the dark and talked about how happy this poor family was going to be to get the money the church was going to give them. We had about 80 members in our church, so we figured that whatever amount of money we gave, the offering would be surely 20 times that much. After all, every Sunday, the pastor had reminded everyone to save for the sacrificial offering. The day before Easter, Osi and I walked to the grocery store to get the manager to give us crisp $20 bills and one 10. We ran all the way home to show mom and Darlene. We joined hands and we prayed for the poor family. We had never had so much money. That night we were so excited we could hardly sleep. We didn't care that we wouldn't have new clothes for Easter. We had $70 for the sacrificial offering. We could hardly wait to get to the church. Mom said that our Father in Heaven was smiling on us. The next morning, rain was pouring and we didn't own an umbrella. The church was over a mile from our home. But it didn't matter how wet we got. Darlene had cardboard in her shoes to fill the holes. The cardboard came apart, and she made us laugh at her squishy feet. Then we sat in church so happy. I heard a teenage friend say the Smith girls didn't get a new Easter dress. 
And I didn't care because I felt rich. When the sacrificial offering plate was passed down the pews, we were sitting in the second row. Mom put in a $10 bill. Each of us put in a 20 As we walked home after church, we sang all the way. At lunch, Mom had a surprise for us. She had bought a dozen eggs, and we had boiled Easter eggs with our fried potatoes. Late that afternoon, the minister drove up in his car. Mom went to the door, talked with him a moment, came back with an envelope in her hand. We asked, what is that? She didn't say a word. She just opened the envelope and out fell a bunch of money. There were three crisp $20 bills, one $10 bill, and 17 $1 bills. Mom put the money back in the envelope. We didn't talk. We just sat and stared at the floor. We didn't understand how anybody could think we were poor. We kids had such a happy life. We actually felt sorry for those that didn't have our mom for a parent. We had constant visits from our four older brothers and sisters and their kids. Everybody in our house was always laughing and happy. We thought we were rich. We thought it was fun to share silverware. We thought it was fun to see who got the knife that night that we passed around for whoever might need it. Oh, I knew we didn't have a lot of things that other people had, but I never thought we were poor. That Easter, I found out we were. The minister had brought the sacrificial offering to the poor family, us, so we must be poor. And I didn't like being poor. I looked at my dress and worn out shoes, and I felt suddenly ashamed. I didn't want to go back to church. Everyone at church already probably knew we were poor. I thought about school. I was in the ninth grade, top of my class of 100 students. I wondered if the kids at school knew we were poor. We sat in silence for a long time, then it got dark. Without a word, we all went to bed. All that week, we girls went to school, came home, no one laughed, no one talked very much. Finally, on Saturday, Mom called another meeting and asked us, what do you girls want to do with the sacrificial offering? We didn't know. What did poor people do with money? We didn't know. We had never known we were poor. We didn't want to go to church on Sunday, but Mom said we were going to worship God every week, no matter what. Although it was a sunny day, we didn't feel like talking. Mom started to sing. We didn't join in, so she stopped after one verse. We were surprised at church by a missionary speaker. He talked about how churches in Africa made buildings out of sun-dried bricks, but they needed money to buy roofs. He said $100 would put a roof on a church in Africa. The minister said, can't we all sacrifice to help these poor people? We looked at each other and smiled for the first time in a week. Mom reached into her purse and pulled out the envelope. She passed it to Darlene. Darlene gave it to me. I handed it to Osi. Osi put it in the offering plate as it passed down our aisle. When the offering was counted, the minister announced that it was a little over a hundred dollars. The missionary was so excited, he kept saying, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. He hadn't expected such a big offering out of our little church. He said, you have some rich people in this church, praise the Lord. Suddenly it struck us. We had given $87 of a little over $100 that he was bragging about. Mom was right. We were not only blessed, we were the richest family in our church. Hadn't the missionary just said so? 
From that day on, I've never been poor again. I've always remembered how blessed and rich I am because our mom taught us that our father is the king of the universe. We are his children and everything he has is ours. Tomorrow is Mother's Day. While most of our families wouldn't make the cover of a magazine painted by Norman Rockwell, they are the families into which God has put us. And Mother's Day is a perfect opportunity to praise God, praise God that we were born into this world. Have you ever praised God for being born? Because otherwise, we would not have the opportunity to love and serve God and to live forever with him and to live forever with the redeemed from all ages and to be a part of God's perfect family. I praise God for that, don't you?